thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation to to speak. I'm I'm humbled to uh, to be here. Um, those of you that know me, I, I live with a four-year-old and a six-year-old, so I don't get to talk very much in my house, and so this is a treat for me to uh, to be out and have a little bit, bit of adult talk, and uh, also to see this wonderful institute that's here in Ocala that I've heard so much about, and um, and I think is a is a prize uh, possession of the state of Florida and a and a great investment. So I think. Um, Anna, and I also thank um, Roe for the invitation to, to speak here tonight, and Jose Gaudier for, uh, for reaching out to me to uh, make the trip, which isn't far, by the way, from, from Gainesville. So thank you uh, for the invitation to speak, and um, I will try to make it an interesting evening uh, for you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, a small book um, that um, we published for Parkinson Awareness Month uh, almost a year ago uh, to the day. Um, about some secrets to a happier life. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my thoughts on the American healthcare system and you know what I think we can do to move the chess pieces to be more effective. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the hope and some of the research and some of the things that might be coming forward. So it should be a whirlwind, um, interesting uh, journey that uh, we'll walk you through uh, tonight. And I certainly appreciate your uh, attention. Uh, this is uh, where I'm from, just in case anybody is wondering. I'm sure you all have seen the University of Florida campus picture. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. It was uh, built on a land grant and from Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and uh, it is 2,000 acres. And there are lots of people on this campus, as I'm going to show you. And when we decided to move from Emory to University of Florida in 2002, uh, there were only three of us. It was myself and Dr. Foote and one staff member, and that's how we started. There was no Parkinson's program, there were no movement disorders, but there were all these people on this wonderful campus that um, provided you know, a really rich and collaborative environment to maybe try to invent something that was a little different than what we've seen in the healthcare system and what we've seen in research uh, before. And so um, if you uh, will entertain me just for a few minutes, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the vision that we had when we came here and what we really wanted to, to try to accomplish. And so uh, what we were aiming to do was to change healthcare from a situation where it's lucky to see your doctor and the doctor's the son and you just bow to the doctor and you're lucky to get in there and you know if you get anything else it's just absolute, um, absolutely amazing, including your parking, as you know, can be difficult. And so what our dream was in 2002 was to build a facility. And what we came up with was a 15,000 square foot um, headquarters that would bring together this expansive resource from across all colleges and from all departments and bring people together for the patient. And so the idea was that what we wanted to do is we wanted to make the patient, the sun, and we wanted to orbit around the patient. Really interesting concept, right? Because right now, the way the American healthcare system is set up is that the doctor is the sun, and we revolve around the doctor. And that's probably not the best or most efficient way to deliver care, particularly when we're talking about chronic disease. And if we all live long enough, by the way, we're all going to get chronic diseases. And so we should come up with a way to move our chest pieces around in order to provide a better solution for patients. And so what we came up with was a, a single facility where we could provide an interdisciplinary, patient-centered experience for uh, people that were suffering from Parkinson's disease and movement disorders. And so our first patient that took a patient-centered tour was Janet Reno, who many of you may uh, recognize. Um, she even drove here through Ocala and Gainesville in her red pickup truck when she ran for the governorship of, of the state of Florida. And the idea of the center was let's make everything completely convenient for the patients and let's hook them up to the best clinical care, the best research care, the best outreach, and the best education. Let's do it in all, all in one day and let's make sure that we're servicing everybody. And so what happens is, is when you come into the center, it's located across the street from a hotel from the Hilton. You guys have a Hilton here too in Ocala. 
And the idea is, is that patients come in from all over the world. So we see patients from Nepal, we see patients from Sarajevo, from South America. So they can come in, they can park, they can come across the street, and they can be seen in the center and have all their services done in a single day, access to all the research. And when you check in at the center, there's no barriers here. There's no barriers to the nurses. You get to talk to anybody that you want. You get to have access. You get to have our emails. You get to have relationships with us. It's not a typical sterile you know, doctor or therapist facilitated interaction. It's, it's a totally open interaction where we're trying to work for the patient's good and also integrate the patients into the research experience. When you check in, you get a dance card. What's a dance card? Well, we hook something like many of you have name tags on. I see one in the front here. Imagine you get a tag that has all the appointments that you're supposed to see for the day and the times. It makes everybody totally aware of where you need to be and when you need to be there and who you need to see. And if we need to add anybody, we just add somebody or subtract somebody to your schedule. We check your balance, we check your walking, we do automated checks of your breathing and your ability to swallow and cough because as you age, what are the things that are gonna get you in trouble? Hip fractures, falls, aspiration pneumonia. These are the leading causes of death. Hence, we should be monitoring them preventatively at every visit and making sure that we're addressing anything that may come up and as well sending this information along to our research colleagues. And we generate all sorts of interesting data and information. We also have done everything we can to make the clinic not look like a clinic. We don't want the normal sterile experience, so any advice that we got as to what colors or this should be in a clinic, if, it, if, the, if the sentence started, this should be in a clinic, we said we don't want it. And so we have done as much as we can to change the situation so it's relaxing. This is James Oliverio. He works at the Digital Worlds Institute at University of Florida. He designed an interactive experience for patients where this screen actually moves. You see um, actually locations. Uh, this has now been updated to spots that have been shot all over Florida, very nice, serene places that you might have peaceful, that you might be looking for thoughts. There's even some nature uh, behind some of the scenes that's there, a very beautiful um, way for you to sit. And hopefully our goal is that you don't sit in the waiting room for long. But if you do, at least you have a, a good experience. Now, James also, uh, one of his uh, other professions is scoring uh, symphonies for Wynton Marsalis in the Lincoln Center. And he uh, also is most famous for developing the interactive technology to be able to conduct orchestras on multiple continents. So these are the kinds of resources you have at big universities like Central Florida, like South Florida, like University of Florida, bringing these people together to try to create better experiences, better clinics, better research experiences. We have a room that if you've never been to the center before, I call it the National Park Room. So when you go to a national park, I personally majored in history and would have been a historian if there were jobs in history. And <laughs> It turns out when you go to these national parks, what happens is they show you a movie before you go to the park and the movie explains everything that's gonna happen to you, okay? And as soon as you see the movie, you say, oh, now I understand, this is how it works, okay? And so the light bulb goes off and you're able to understand the experience that you're gonna get, which is a completely patient-centric experience. The design is to bring all the specialties into one location. So you've got 10 different practitioners, neurosurgeons, next to psychiatrists, next to psychologists. By the way, it generates a lot of research, not just good care for patients. What's the highest level of care we can offer people in America or anywhere in the world? Talking behind their backs, okay? If people are talking behind your backs that are taking care of you, then you're getting good care, okay? If you have lots of people who are actually just writing consultations and saying, oh, you should do this, you should do that, and sending letters to each other, but nobody's talking to each other, that's poor care. So true interdisciplinary care, I like to say patients talking behind their backs, all the specialties coming together, no one specialty being more important than another. The doctor's not the god, the doctor's not the son, the patient's the son, we revolve around the patient. There are other things that I think are important. 
it's important to have a nice experience. So the patients get the windows. And I don't know if you, anybody here has been to the patient-centered hospital in Hawaii, but one of the most important aspects of that hospital is patients get nice views. So when you're sick, you get access to your docs. You also get access to the interdisciplinary services, and it's a nice scenario. The other thing that's nice about that hospital that we borrowed is the idea that the patients own the land. You know, we're just there serving them. And so the patients actually compete for spots on the wall. They paint everything that's on the wall, and there's a beautiful collection of art that gets competed by the patients. And our fine arts college, James Oliverio, Joe Sonke, who runs our dance program in the fine arts college, some of the neurologists, the therapists, we all sit together, judge the art, and you gotta be good to get up on the wall and get this plate, okay? And so all of the art, everything that you see in the center is done by the patients. And this is a picture of a, of a patient, and this is how he sees himself after making his brain uh, electric. This is how he uh, views his, how his life has changed. The other thing that's important in a modern healthcare system is that you're not talking to a computer. Talking to a computer is bad. Okay, I mean, it's, it really creates a bad experience for patients. It doesn't leave a good taste in your mouth. It doesn't leave you with a lot of confidence about what the people who were treating you were telling you to do. So the computers are attached to the furniture, the furniture moves, the computers are attached to the system that shows scans, and it's also attached to the research system that tracks all your data, all of which is available to the patients at all times. And so it doesn't look like you're just looking at the computer, you're trying to share with the patient the experience as much as possible. You gotta have access to interventions, whether they're drugs, Toxins like botulinum toxin, which by the way isn't just for wrinkles and was used for Parkinson's and movement disorders well before it was used for wrinkles. And uh, other therapies like making the brain electric with deep, deep brain stimulation, behavioral therapies, and an incubator to, to develop new therapies based on what the patients tell us. Here's one great example. This is a device developed by Chris Sapienza, Danny Martin, and Paul Davenport, and the patients were telling us that they were having problems coughing, swallowing, aspiration pneumonia, leading cause of death in Parkinson's disease. They developed a device that you can take home, keep in your pocket, exercise with it a few times a day, reduces your aspiration risk published it, level one evidence, this reduces aspiration risk in Parkinson, number one cause of death in Parkinson's disease. It's because the patients, the patients told the researchers, the researchers then went back, they worked together, they worked out a solution to the problem, brought it back to the patients. Similarly, other, other researchers that are next to Dr. Sapienza, the psychologist said, hmm, that's an interesting device. I wonder if you take the device backwards and instead of having patients breathe out, you have them breathe in, whether the poker face gets better in Parkinson's disease, and those of you that know Parkinson, then a few of you may have it, know that it sometimes comes with a masked face or a poker face expression. If you turn the valve backwards, there's a large federal grant that just finished at our institution through a collaboration showing that we can treat the facial expression, which by the way is something that women are interested in, men are uninterested in, unless they're male politicians. <laughs> true story. That's very true. I'm not lying. The rehabilitative services are all in one location so that when you're being seen, you're gonna check in, you're gonna see each of the different specialties. They're gonna create a plan for you, but uh-oh, wait a minute, you don't live in that city. So this happens as well too. And I go back to my city and there's no specialty person in that rehab area for my city, what do I do? Well. The idea here is, is that you're checking in with these people each time you're coming to the center. They're making the plan, they're sending the plan, interfacing, talking to your therapist locally, making sure you're getting the right therapies so that there's a way to deliver that makes sense and connects the therapy services. And so the continuum of care, believe it or not, should continue once you leave the office of your healthcare practitioner. All of the diagnostic studies, MRIs, CT scans, swallowing studies to make sure that you're not aspirating or sending fluid into the lungs, that's what aspiration means. All of this needs to happen in one place. And by the way, a lot of people can't travel. So we need to develop technologies and techniques to get to the people, reach into their homes and be able to treat them. And so we have a telemedicine link where we can see patients from all over the world through this. Unfortunately, if you do this in the United States, you can be extradited 
were sent to the state to stand trial for practicing medicine without a license if you go across state boundaries. And so there's now legislation in front of the Congress, which they have not acted upon for several years, but hopefully they will, that will redefine telemedicine in the United States as to where the doctor is, not where the patient lives. Once you do that, then the doctor becomes licensed in that state. We're gonna be able to provide great care. And guess what? Parkinson's is a very visual specialty. So that means that you can see a lot of what you need to from a screen. You can also do a lot of the electronic tuning and other things in the brain I'll tell you about later from a distance as well. And this is one example. Many years ago, we smuggled a couple of devices into the Philippines. It was the first time they had this stimulator operation where there were leads in the brain. We left the Philippines after teaching them how to put them in, what are they going to do with the patients? And so we would teleconference, and this is the first patient that was implanted in the Philippines, and we would go back and forth with that team as a, another way to interface uh, to be able to deliver care. Very easy to do with the technology. This is really simple concepts and very important. Also, you need to make sure everybody that you're seeing in a modern medical practice, you're collecting data both for clinical and for research. And so we have the largest integrated clinical research database um, in, on the UF campus. And in fact, the largest clinical study, we follow over 7,000 patients. Every time you come in, if you watch that introductory video, that National Park video, you can sign a consent. We'll take all of your information, we'll throw it into a database, we'll even show it to you at every visit if you wanna see. We can tell what the outcomes are, share the information, improve the quality of care, improve the outcomes for patients. It's just a better way to practice medicine. We also have to train the future, and we have not only fellows that train with us from all the different specialties, we have postdoc fellows, so people who have done complete neurology residencies who will spend a year or two with us afterward. We usually have six or eight from American universities, and we see you know, four or five, six people from overseas coming over to see what's going on and helping them to learn how can you create a center like this and how can you bring it out to your own communities? How can we export the know-how so people can not not only learn about the medicine and the apprenticeship, but also bring it out to people and try to improve uh, their quality of life. Finally, the last aspect of creating, I think, a great uh, uh, model for care is making sure that you have all of the great research studies available on site right away. So if there's something that's going on, so we have over 100 different studies, you don't have to wait. You see all your practitioners, you say, yeah, I'd like to be in the study. I heard about it. I read about it. Oh, yeah, okay, great. Here's the coordinator. Let us tell you about it. Here are the risks and benefits. Would you like to enroll? Would you like to become part of the research, part of the solution? And so having this on site creates the marriage. It completes the, the circle, everything from great care to the potential and the hope of research. So with that, I wanna to transition to um, tell you a little bit about this book, uh, about 10 Secrets. And the book is really about all of these patients who have come from all over the world with all of these problems. And it seems after many years of looking at these patients that there are lots of things that people are not doing that they could do to live a better life with this disease that we call Parkinson's. And so let me start by saying this is a slide summarizing my career, okay, at the University of Florida. This is where I started, okay, like Beaker from the Muppets, okay. I got my first job, my boss said, you know, Michael, you're a nice kid, you're a polite kid, but you're gonna stick things into people's brains, so don't embarrass us, because this probably isn't gonna stick around, okay? This is gonna be a crazy technology that's here and gone. Somewhere in the middle of my career at UF, I got my first promotion to associate professor, and people were saying, hey, that's kind of cool. Not cool enough that I'd wanna do it, but you know, there's some cool things that are going on with the networks and the brain, and you know, maybe there's something to this. Maybe this isn't snake oil, sticking things in people's brain and pumping electricity sounds a little, little crazy. And now, you know, after being promoted to professor, I feel like Cookie Monster in the smoking jacket. People are arriving on the doorstep from other countries, from all these places, demanding to have deep brain stimulators, you know, demanding to have their brains electrified for all sorts of things, some of which are appropriate and some of which may not be quite ready for prime time. Anything that I tell you tonight is a result of this group of really awesome people that I work with. This is our interdisciplinary team, and so please don't mistake that this is all brilliance from one man standing in front of you here tonight. This is because of this great group of people. 
So what are these secrets? What are all these secrets to living with Parkinson's disease? You know, what is this that this guy is trying to, to, to talk to us about? So the goals of writing the book were simple, and I think they were really well articulated by Muhammad Ali, who always likes to crack jokes and, and um, is very joking. And he, he actually uh, came up with this quote, and he said, there isn't any joking with Dr. Oaken about the 10 secrets for a happier life in Parkinson's disease. Now this is the most important part. He says, the book is a critical resource for Parkinson patients and families from around the world who speak different languages, but suffer from very similar and often disabling symptoms. Patients from around the world who speak different languages, but suffer from many of the same symptoms. Parkinson's is everywhere. I've been all over the globe. It is everywhere. And in fact, the epidemic is growing. And this is a pie chart slide to tell you something that should blow your mind and blow you back in your chairs. And that is that Parkinson's disease in 2005 in the United States and around the world, these are the world's eight most populous countries. And if you watch CNN, you're looking for that Malaysian airliner, you'll see there are 25 countries searching for the airliner. This is only the eight most populous, okay? So there's a lot of countries in the world. Four million people in 2005 with Parkinson's disease. 2030, almost nine million, okay? That growth is more than linear growth. That growth is starting to become logarithmic. As we age, as we make people live longer, we are going to be faced with a large burden of neurodegenerative diseases. And in fact, Parkinson will be one of those diseases. In fact, these numbers leave out people that are below the age of 50. And anybody who knows Parkinson's knows that we see patients in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and it becomes more prevalent. We see more cases as people age. So there's a lot more people than what I'm showing you. So these four simple words, you have Parkinson's disease, are going to pierce the heart and drain the dreams of about 50,000 people worldwide every year. And I think it was really brought home by Lu Zhun, the Chinese philosopher, when he talked about roads. And what he said was, hope cannot be said to exist, nor can it be said not to exist. He said there are roads across the earth, and for actually the earth had no roads to begin with. But when many men pass one way, a road is made. It's very true in Parkinson's disease. And on the journey, on this chronic degenerative journey, we are making the road together. We're coming onto this road and plowing forward and exploring and figuring out what this disease is about and what we can do about it. And one thing that I've learned is, is that patients are outstanding at planting seeds of faith. They can learn to grow, they can grow hope, they can discover those core values that are gonna be necessary to live and achieve happiness despite chronic disease. And let me say that again, you can live and achieve happiness despite chronic disease. And so what are the secrets? What are these things that we've learned from all of these people coming in and presenting to us with Parkinson's disease? Well, I'd like to take a few minutes and share with you a few of the things that, that at least I've learned that people have taught me. And I don't think they should be secrets. First is encapsulated by a quote by Jillian Lauren from the novel Pretty. She says, I look for a sign. Where to go next? You never know when you'll get one. Even the most faithless among us are waiting to be proven wrong. I look for a sign. First lesson, first secret. What is Parkinson? What are the signs? And I borrowed this sign from the Alzheimer's Association. I apologize to the Alzheimer's Association, but I love this sign because it says, it has a big arrow and it says, this way to a world without Alzheimer's disease. Okay? And I think it is so important that patients understand what you have and what you don't have. And Parkinson's disease, we're getting pretty doggone good at treating this syndrome. And if you get the right treatments for your motor symptoms and your non-motor symptoms, you can do well. And we have studies now. We have a National Parkinson Foundation longitudinal study, the longest longitudinal study ever attempted in Parkinson's disease, where we're following patients we call PD-10, 20, 30, 40, 50. What's the number? Number of years you live with Parkinson's disease. And so the odds are, are starting to rack up for you. This is not 
Alzheimer's, it's not Lou Gehrig's disease, it's not a brain tumor, okay? This is actually a much more favorable diagnosis and a much more livable diagnosis. And many of you who have Parkinson's disease that are in the crowd may agree with me. This is a livable diagnosis and can be livable. Very important, most people don't understand that. They come in thinking it's the end of the world because they spend five minutes with their doctor and the doctor says, you have Parkinson's disease. And it does pierce their heart and it does drain their dreams and it shouldn't. Another great secret encapsulated by Joshua Harris, the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. So you know I'm a parent when I say that, right? <laughs> the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. And what, what, what do I mean by that? Well, this is a really interesting disease. It's unlike any other that you have ever encountered in medicine, that any other specialty encounters. You actually give certain medications or certain surgeries and patients turn on. What do I mean by turn on? They, it's, it's almost magical. It almost seems like it should be fake or snake oil. They stand up, they start moving, they're able to do things, the tremor goes away, they're walking again. But it's highly dependent as the disease goes on in the timing. You need to get your medications on time every time. This is actually a lesson that's more important than which medicines you get. And people are always like, oh, I have the red one and the purple one and I, I want the, the yellow one and I want the fuchsia one. It's less important which pills you take as to changing the pills over time against the symptoms to control the symptoms and to lead a good life. So most people are seeking this holy grail of the perfect pill and it's actually more about the time that they take their pills and this will change as they have Parkinson. Very important secret, you'd be surprised the number of people that don't appreciate that. Here's another favorite quote uh, of mine. It's a little bit dark, you'll have to forgive me. This is from Jared Kintz. He says, I have a favorite cemetery I go to because it's really clean and the doctors and the nurses are all very nice. I have a favorite cemetery I go to because it's really clean and the doctors and nurses are all very nice. It's funny, but it's actually kind of true in Parkinson's disease. And this is a cartoon that I stole from Google about how to survive a hospitalization. And it's really important because we actually kill Parkinson patients in the hospital. We don't do it on purpose. It's not like we say, oh, okay, you have Parkinson's, we're gonna kill you now. You know, that's not how it works. You go into the hospital and they don't understand you need your meds on time every time. They don't understand certain meds are gonna block the dopamine that's very important to your brain and very important to this disease. And so we need to have ways to help patients survive. And this is a great cartoon. It says things like set daily goals, wear your slippers, you know, listen, but don't listen blindly, enjoy the perks, and, and I love this one. Get the nurse's food. Get the nurse's food. Very important tip to surviving. Well, it turns out that in the hospital, we've begun to study this, and we've published three or four papers on this with the National Parkinson Network. And one of the things that we've learned is that three out of four people with Parkinson's don't get their medications on time. We've learned they get the wrong medicines. We've learned all these preventable errors, so what are we doing about it? Well, we're trying to change the electronic medical record systems across the country so that there'll be ways in which people can automatically understand this. But it turns out that this is sort of a hard nut to crack, you know, kind of like getting legislation through Congress. So what we came up with is this nice little bag. And this is like the bag that you take with you if any of you have ever had kids before. You pack a bag, you put it next to the door, and you gotta be ready to go to the hospital you know, at a moment's notice or even less when the water breaks. You gotta have everything ready. We've given out 20 to 30,000 of these kits now, and we plan to give out more to people. They have rip-offs on them with all the things you should do, you shouldn't do, things you can hand your nurses. It has a little seal on it. It comes from a credible organization and people go, oh, ooh, I better follow this. This saves lives. And so we're trying to teach patients to be their own advocates. And we know from the research that there are very high rates of hospitalization for Parkinson patients. One in three chance every year you might go to the hospital for a Parkinson-related phenomenon or not, but you'll be in the hospital and you'll have Parkinson's and you'll be at risk. We can save lives. Why are we not saving lives? We're not educating. So we're gonna put the power back into the patients. Another great tip is from this guy named Plato, which many of you may have heard of. He actually said many years ago, lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being 
while movement and methodical physical exercise save and preserve it. Sounds kind of hokey, right? Of course you exercise and you exercise is healthy, you're gonna get better, exercise is always good. Well, it turns out folks that in Parkinson's disease, there's actually plenty of research that's been done at Florida and many other institutions all over the world showing that exercise in Parkinson's is especially important. Why? When you exercise, it's like dropping miracle Grow on your brain. There are these things called neurotrophic factors. And in fact, we've done these studies where we drilled holes in people's brains and tried to shoot neurotrophic factors onto the brain for neurodegenerative diseases. Turns out you can naturally put neurotrophic factors on your brain by exercising. And so we always recommend exercising every day. Good for symptoms, and some people think it may even slow disease progression. We don't know the answer to that, but certainly there are lots of benefits to exercising. Why people don't exercise every day with Parkinson? Probably because we don't tell them that exercise is good. Really important secret, helps a lot of people. This is a nice quote by Clara Hughes, and um, this is, I think, very instructive. And, and she says, I've had some experience in dealing with people who have mental illness and depression, but I did not see the signs in myself. Does this sound familiar to anyone? I couldn't ask for help as I didn't know I needed help. Well, we now know in Parkinson's disease that depression is the most common unmet need and occurs in more than 50% of patients. And so I ask you the question, if you look at Parkinson's and people think tremors and stiffness and slowness, and then, but Parkinson patients also have depression and anxiety and sleep deprivation, what's more important, those motor symptoms like tremor or the non-motor symptoms like depression or anxiety? What do you think is more important to your quality of life? It's the non-motor symptoms, absolutely. What does your doctor treat? what he or she sees. What do they see? Tremor, stiffness, slowness. So they're missing the big picture. And so it's really important, and there was a nice article um, that came out in the USA Today about this. This is Joyce Oberdorf, the um, CEO of National Parkinson, talking about the first results that came off the presses on that Parkinson outcome project, depression being the biggest hurdle for Parkinson patients. It's something that's part of the disease, and people uh, need to understand that it's not their fault. It's not that they're just sad because they have Parkinson's. It's because the chemicals have changed in the brain, the electrical signals have changed. There's a real biological phenomenon. If we treat it, their lives get better, even more than if we treat the motor symptoms. So that's sort of sobering to think about, but really important, something that we're not doing a good enough job on. Now, those of you who read Nathaniel Hawthorne in uh, high school uh, may think that this is going to be a bad quote, but I promise you he actually has a beautiful quote here. He says, is it a fact or have I dreamt it that by means of electricity, the world of matter has become a great nerve, vibrating thousands of miles in a breathless point of time? And I love that quote because it encapsulates the idea of can we make your brain electric? And a number of years ago, uh, Dr. Foote and I did this TED Talk where we were talking about, you know, we can control your brain, okay? And that should make you feel kind of uncomfortable, right? We can put something in your head and we can control your brain. Turns out that anything that we give you, exercise, drugs, factors we pump on your brain, electricity, is, is a form of brain control. So think about that. Ethically, we always, always have to have an ethical guiding principle if we're gonna stick something in someone's brain. And so what we proposed in this talk is that the ethical guiding principle should be to alleviate human suffering. It shouldn't be like plastic surgery where we're trying for an enhancement, okay? It should be to alleviate human suffering. And I'm gonna show you why that's important. And so the premise is, is that your brain controls everything. And we can control your brain, okay? And the way that we do that is we stick these little straws into the brain, and this was from a little review article that we wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine summarizing the field and where we are with it. And basically, we can stick these little straws in and pump a tiny amount of electricity. That's what this little pink spot is here into the brain. This much electricity and change your symptoms in multiple diseases. There is no neuroscientist that could have predicted 
that it was going to be possible to pump this much. I mean, look at my fingers here. You can't see between them. This much electricity into the brain is going to have these widespread changes. It's actually, it's an amazing uh, phenomenon. And the question is, is, is it science or is there something behind it? And where I started my career was recording out of brains. And we use these little instruments. And this comes from an article in this month's issue of Smithsonian. And you see this is Victoria, our scrub tech. And the, you can see they have to blur her so you can see the tip of the microelectrode here. And it's so small, it's measured in microns. We measure the, the diameter of a red blood cell in microns. It's because we need to creep up next to those cells and listen to how they are talking to different areas of the brain and try to choose the right spots to modulate the networks. And that's what my lab has been interested in for over a decade is modulating these networks, not only in Parkinson's disease, but we've also been after finding tics and Tourette syndrome, tremors, and in other um, disorders. And we work together. It's a team. There's not one member here that does all the work. So this is the neurosurgeon, Dr. Foote. This is me in the operating room. But this team has over 15 people okay, that serve the patient. We revolve around the patient. And you've probably seen uh, videos like this before. This is with Parkinson's disease. And you can see um, to your uh, left is uh, preoperatively. And to your right is uh, postoperatively. And you can see he has a really bad tremor. The tremor is suppressed. The stiffness, the slowness improve in the patients. And so we've gotten really good at suppressing tremor, at stopping these drug-induced extra movements called dyskinesia, and patients bouncing around on their medications called fluctuations. We're very good at some symptoms. But guess what, folks? We have, to, we have to take a humble pill and realize we still have lots of other symptoms that we need to address, like walking, falling, balance, gait. So as powerful as we are as modulating this network, it's really important that we understand these networks and we begin to target other symptoms that are important to people's quality of life. And we have a new project in the lab now that's looking at some of these symptoms and recording out of the brain's network, trying to teach devices to respond in real time to the patients to try to capture some of these symptoms. Right now what we do is we pump electricity and magically into this network and we improve the symptoms of patients. And it's because we change multiple areas across this really beautiful neural network. So this tiny area, it's like a node in a circuit, but you catch the circuit in a place where it affects many other areas. And so it lights up this whole grid and turns some people back on. We need to understand this phenomenon better. Things that are humbling, lessons that we've learned over time. Well, let's look at, this is another picture. This is a, a young boy before an operation. Um, he's about age eight here. This is Christopher. This is before the operation. This is after the operation. But how, how is this for humbling? He has a disease called dystonia, which is where the muscles fight against each other. You actually see this as a manifestation of Parkinson's. But what happens is, is when you implant these children, and we've done now you know, about 85, 95 cases of, of dystonia, when you put the leads in, it's very disappointing. It's very anticlimactic. You put it in, you turn it on, and unlike tremor, nothing happens. But if you wait, you know, a month or two later, the kids and the young adults will tell you, you know, my hands are starting to get you know, softer. I'm starting to be able to move better. My neck is getting less stiff. And at three or four months, the legs will start to improve. And, and you see this slow transformation. So something is happening to the signals in the brain over time as they're exposed to electricity. And what's going to happen is, is one day he's going to wake up and he's going to tell his mom, Mom, I think I can walk. He's going to throw away his wheelchair. He's going to get on the bus and he's going to go to school with the other kids. Over the course of six months, he's going to convert from this picture to this picture. So you think, well, oh, that's awesome. You know, that's a great we should do this for every kid, every adult, every American should get this operation. It doesn't work in everybody. This is a chromosome 9 abnormality called DYT1 or Oppenheim's dystonia. Works well in a lot of these children, not completely, but very well, and sets them back in life on a normal course. They have normal cognition. They're able to interact with their environments. But there are many forms of dystonia and Huntington's disease and other forms of dystonia that don't respond well, we have to understand that better. We're using Parkinson's as our test bed to understand this technology, and we're using it to expand to other people and to other disorders. 
So this is a patient who, um, who was very humbling. This is a first patient in our study where we were looking at a disorder called obsessive compulsive disorder. This is a disorder that Howard Hughes had where they're afraid of germs uh, are gonna get on you, you become reclusive, and in fact it can lead to death as it did in Howard Hughes. This is a patient who traveled to Gainesville from Davenport, Iowa, and um, let me show you. Next condition. So when the stimulator comes on, actually one side of her face smiles, then she develops a full smile and becomes euphoric. Oh, man. <laughs> Describe what you're feeling right now. I feel happy. Feel happy? Can you describe that? I feel happy like... Like, <laughs> like, someone just called me and told me that I won a cruise. So, so this should make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Now we're tapping into circuits that are important to the limbic system, to your behavior, to your emotion. And remember, we have to go back to that ethical principle. We should be doing this to alleviate human suffering. But as we're tapping into these areas, we've learned from Parkinson patients, sometimes we accidentally make them laugh or cry or do funny things or have panic. We're mapping the brain and also mapping a future for how we can get a hold of these networks and try to improve specific symptoms and specific diseases. So it's an exciting time and I would argue there's a lot of science now developing behind this and behind the beautiful neural networks and how we can manipulate them with electricity or other factors. And so I think it's a very exciting time that we're seeing. And I think it's encapsulated well by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who said, there's no need for fiction in medicine, remarks Foster, for the facts will always beat anything that you fancy. And so it's really important you know, to understand when you're seeing the doctor, always ask them what's new. I always say to people, what's new? That should be either your first or your last question, but you should definitely ask that question every time you see your doctor and every time you see your interdisciplinary team. Because there's all sorts of really interesting things going on with vaccines, with inhalers, with different medications, with different networks, with electricity. It's really important. Ask for the evidence. What do we know about it? Is it real? Is it tourism? Are they just trying to take your money? Is it a real um, you know, research protocol? Do you really enroll? Is somebody really watching you? But there are all sorts of really interesting things that are going on. And you, as the patients, will direct us as the team to be able to develop it. We cannot develop these therapies without you. I think that maybe you magically think we're going to come up with a big cure or a big therapy for Parkinson's disease, but we actually need you in order to do that. So it's a partnership. And we have lots of great avenues for patients. I write a forum each month um, uh, called What's Hot in Parkinson's Disease on this website for National Parkinson. We also have an Ask the Doctor and a free helpline um, that people can call in on. And on the Ask the Doctor forum on the website, we've answered, I think since 2006, 20 to 30,000 questions from every continent except for Antarctica. But I heard this morning in the news Antarctica's melting, so we could be okay. <laughs> Okay, now I was in Dallas, Texas uh, um, last week and um, this is a biker named uh, Davis Finney who's a very inspirational guy and he brought a thousand of his friends out to one of these uh, meetings uh, for Parkinson's disease and we got this discussion at the dinner and you know the book is titled 10 Secrets and I realized after talking to Davis that maybe there should be an 11th secret because I think it's important to remember that you can overcome uh, a lot if you put your mind to it. And certainly bikers in particular, you know, on Tour de France and everything, they can overcome what the body can't do with their mind. And so I think it's best encapsulated by Buddha. And Buddha says, it's better to conquer yourself than to win a thousand battles. Then the victory is yours. It cannot be taken from you, not by angels, not by demons, heaven or hell. So I thank you for the invitation to, um, to speak to you um, tonight uh, about the book, about the secrets, and about some of the exciting things that are going on. 
and, um, and I'll stick around and answer any questions. Um, I'm not a traveling book salesman, everybody always asks, but you can order the book on Amazon.com, smash words. It's in 20 different languages, and all the other language translations besides English are for free. And the book is made as, as cheaply as possible. And so, so this is a, a compliment of many of the 35 fellows that we've trained around the world have created all sorts of versions of this to get the information out. And so I'm very, very grateful uh, to them. So thank you very much. And um, I would like to answer any questions if there's time. Please remember to use the microphone to ask a question. Yes. Question. Back here. You mentioned freezing. Is there anything being developing in that? So freezing, uh, so let me just repeat your question. Question is about freezing and Parkinson's. Freezing is a phenomenon where usually one leg, sometimes two legs, but usually one just sticks to the ground. And it's really bad if you're trying to turn because then you're gonna trip over that leg. And so freezing of gait is one of those symptoms that's very vexing for patients. Sometimes medications help, sometimes dose interval helps, sometimes physical therapy helps. Actually, at the moment, there's several medication trials that people are looking at, and our laboratory is actually looking at a very clever way of trying to trick the brain's networks with the stimulator to deliver a pulse to an area of the brain called the PPN or the paramedian nucleus to try to alleviate freezing for the people that develop that symptom later in the course of the disease. And so it's not ready for prime time, but it's certainly one strategy that we've thought about to try to address that problem. And we see that as a major problem for patients, the shuffling and the freezing. More questions in the back there? Those are my children, by the way. I have a friend in his, uh, who in his early 50s was diagnosed with Parkinson's, and uh, he had the implants done first on one side of, of the brain and then on the other side of the brain. And I think he experienced that there was some immediate relief, and then over time it became far less effective. Ha have you been addressing that issue and you know, what, what's happening on that front? So that's a great question. So you go through all this trouble, you drill one hole, maybe two holes, you make somebody's brain electric, they get a little bit of benefit and then the benefit goes away. And so it turns out that um, this is a phenomenon that is real. Anytime you put a device on the market, you know, it looks great in trials and then once you put the device out, you find out wait a minute, maybe this thing isn't as good as I thought because people start you know, to present with device failures. So back in 2005, we actually had published a paper in the Archives of Neurology where we looked at people that came in with these device failures. Since that time, we've sentenced ourselves to becoming the institution in the world that people send their device failures to because everybody reads that paper because everybody has Google and an internet connection. And so I see one or two of these patients every week. And it turns out that if you look carefully and you systematically evaluate these patients, we do it over two days, the most common reason for people to um, have a, a transient days to weeks or a few months benefit that goes away is the lead is in the wrong location. So when you first put it in the right location, if you're right in the circuit, it's gonna light up the grid. If you're close to the circuit, you're gonna have disrupted it by pushing the lead into the brain, you're gonna have a little bit of swelling around it, but eventually that's gonna go away and you're not gonna be able to recapture the benefit. The other thing that we hear people say is they go in and somebody lights it up and changes and there's about 60,000 different settings that you can put on each device. They change the setting, they go, oh my God, this is great. They walk out of the office, 24 hours later, they go back to normal. Usually it's a real estate problem and we look very carefully measuring those leads down to millimeter um, diameters to see you know, whether it's in the right place. So there are several reasons. And the most important thing is, is when somebody has a failure of the device, there's been too much assumption in the field that, oh, the device failed, I tried that, I lined up, I stood in the line, I got it, I did everything I was supposed to do, it doesn't work, so I just need to move on. When you deal with these types of devices that have to be in precise areas of the brain, where one millimeter is the distance between California and Florida, 
You know, when it's that precise, you should never assume that a failure is just that I tried it and it didn't work. More than 50% of the patients in that original series in 2005, and it's been our experience since that time, can be meaningfully improved uh, by looking at their leads and sometimes making programming medication adjustments. And every once in a while, we also take patients back to the OR, revise their leads, and they get better. And so, so those would be the general, that would be my three hour talk in three minutes. So, on that topic. Is there a question over here? Okay, I got, I'll get you in a second, I promise. I saw you. Make sure we haven't forgotten anybody back there too. I, you're sort of around my reach. I'm gonna I, fall off if I go any further. I had a question about uh, healthcare providers, um, training and healthcare uh, facilities. My mother was in and out of uh, assisted living, and uh, we were talking about the timing of medication. Healthcare facilities often say, oh, well, we've, okay, they're supposed to have it at nine, but we actually can give it to them at eight, or we can give it to them at 10. There's a two hour, and if I hadn't been there to, you know, to help, no, she needs it now, and she would need it sometimes when she could feel her symptoms. Is anything being done to kind of instruct them or let them know that it's really important that they get it on time? Yes, let me just repeat your question again. The question is, is in these healthcare facilities, sometimes you go in and they say, you know what, we're busy, and when I say the medicine needs to be given at this time, that's plus or minus two hours. Well, that might work if you have high blood pressure. It might not, actually, but it may. You may get away with it with cardiac disease. You sometimes get away with it di by, with diabetes. You never get away with it in somebody who has moderate to severe Parkinson's disease. And in fact, it can lead to them not turning on, becoming stiff, aspirating, falling out of bed. So there are a couple of tricks. One is get the kit, because in the kit, you have a ripoff and it has all those instructions on it, and that's the number one main thing. You give it to the nurses and you teach the nurses. Second, you tell the doctors to rewrite the orders with exact times and next to each thing on time every time. And then also we tell them to clip the slip onto it and say there's credible evidence that shows that this is very important. Third, if it's possible, if you're in the hospital, uh, many hospitals will allow you, if you bring the original bottles of the medications, they'll allow you to turn the bottles into the pharmacist who will then open the bottle, make sure that you have what you say you have, mark it, tag it, and then an order can be written to allow you to take your own meds or to have somebody who's with you administer the meds. I know it sounds crazy, but at least for the Parkinson's meds, they can handle all the rest in the hospital. You're much safer having somebody that knows, either the patient or somebody else. And so there's a couple of strategies. Despite all of those strategies, we still see problems and barriers and, um, and it can be difficult to overcome, sometimes enough so that you have to move patients to a different institution or, or to a, a different place that will appreciate it. But usually you'll get the attention of the administrators if you show them the evidence, and that's why the kit is so good. This gentleman over here. Um, I was wondering, with with Parkinson's, is uh, is progression of the disease imminent? And if it is, is it um, consistent or individual, um, affecting people differently? Okay. So it's a great question. So the question is, is, is about, is Parkinson's a progressive disease and how will it progress? Will it be fast? Will it be slow? What can I expect is usually the question that patients ask. Well, first of all, let me tell you about some humbling lessons that the researchers that we've made over the years. We began to enroll patients who had resting tremor, okay, like many of you have here tonight into studies to look at drugs that will slow progression of Parkinson's disease. The drugs didn't work, but we discovered 15 to 20% of the people we enrolled didn't actually have Parkinson's disease, okay? And so just because you look like you have Parkinson's disease doesn't necessarily mean that you do. And we were trying to pick people out that we thought were gonna get Parkinson because they had a cardinal symptom. 
But if you have the symptoms and they're not progressing at all, it's absolutely possible to get a scan now to look at your dopamine in the brain and show that you actually don't have a progressive degenerative condition. Now for the people that do have a progressive de degenerative condition, yes, Parkinson's progresses, but it progresses usually very slowly. There are different phenotypes, so I always like to say if you have a good doctor, they're like an FBI agent. They're gonna look at you, they're gonna examine you, and they're gonna see what kind of Parkinson do I have? Because Parkinson isn't one disease. It's a group of diseases that can be caused by different genes, different environmental factors, and most cases, 90% of cases are unknown. What causes it? But we lump them all together because that's what we do as Americans. We like to lump things together when we don't know what they are. And so it turns out people with resting tremor in Parkinson have a very benign form. Many of those patients go 20, 30, 40 years with the Parkinson's disease. Then there are other forms that, that are a faster progression and I think a more urgent situation in terms of what can you do to improve the lives you know, of those patients. And so it, it really all depends on that initial examination. But the thing that I wanna stress here tonight the most is how many times I mean, I even heard it again this morning. I met with a few Parkinson patients this morning. You know, you get that, you know, you have Parkinson's disease and it's doom and gloom and the eyes of the neurologist or the general practitioner are looking at you doom and gloom. It's not necessarily doom and gloom. And in fact, many of these patients are gonna live long, great, happy lives despite the fact they have a disease that's slowly progressive, so. Okay, we have time for one last question. Okay, maybe over here, this young lady. Is it possible to uh, have Parkinson's brought on by a medication? So drug-induced Parkinson's, can I take a medicine and can I get Parkinson's symptoms or Parkinson's disease? So it seems like it should be a yes or no question, but I haven't really you know, given you any yes or no answers tonight, so I can't really start on this question, even though it's the last question. <laughs> so it turns out that any drug that blocks dopamine can cause Parkinson-like symptoms, okay? So the most common are headache medications. Compazine, Phenergan, you know, are two that people take a lot. Uh, medicines that restart your gut when your gut's not emptying, metoclopramide, Reglan, you've heard the term Reglan before. So these medicines block dopamine. And if you block dopamine, you can get the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, tremor stiffness, slowness, problems with walking, okay? It, it turns out, she'll bring you a mic for a second. Let me, let me finish answering and then I'll catch the second part of your question. So it turns out that, um, that if you stop those medicines, in many cases over several weeks to several months, the Parkinson goes away. But in many cases, it does not. And it continues to progress and get worse and worse and worse slowly over time. So what's going on? Well, we didn't know for a long time what that phenomenon is, and now with new scans and new technology, we understand that this phenomenon is that many people are destined to get Parkinson's disease. If we live long enough, many, if not most of us, become centenarians, are gonna get some symptoms of Parkinson's. If you take a dopamine-blocking drug, in some patients it's going to unmask what was there already and then you'll begin to see the things that you didn't see before and continue on the regular progression. And so there are drug-induced causes that reverse when you stop. If it doesn't reverse and keeps getting worse, you were probably destined to get Parkinson and it was unmasked by blocking dopamine. Now the second part of your question? Well, my husband was just taken off of amiodarone for heart AFib and because he was developing the symptoms, tremors and his legs giving out under him and so they took him off of it and now he's afraid he's got Parkinson's. So amiodarone is one of those drugs that can cause a drug-induced Parkinson. It's a cardiac drug given for rhythm problems and, and uh, other disturbances of the heart. If he comes off the drug and the symptoms don't go away, then certainly you would suspect it. In the age group, I can't tell you how many people that I've seen that have gone to the hospital and they've gone in for very innocent things, knees, hips, joints, hearts, heart attacks, and they come out with a diagnosis of Parkinson or they come out tremoring and it actually takes somebody several years to figure out they have Parkinson's disease. And so it could be that he has some mild Parkinson that was unmasked by the drug. You'll find out 
by watching him, you know, over time. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.